Hi, Contemporary Themes, and welcome to a reading of Lies by Ethan Kanan. This is my third attempt to get this, so I'm hoping that third time is a charm, and I'm going to try to read this all the way through, so forgive any errors. Uh, anyway, remember what I said about how titles are always important? Well, this story is called Lies, so right away we are asked to think about the different kind of lies, and it plants in our mind who's lying in the story, what are the lies. And one other thing that you should know is that the story is told in the form of a flashback, so it doesn't really follow chronological order. Our speaker, who is a young man, as you'll find out pretty quickly, um, is telling us the story of what happened to him one summer when he met this girl, which, you know, young men sometimes like to do. But so it goes in and out, like he flashes back to a certain point and then he flashes back when he first met her. So that's really kind of important to note into the overall story. And yes, welcome to my living room. If you happen to see a cat around, uh, yeah, just ignore it. Besides, they're a little standoffish lately. I'm not sure why. Um, okay, so the story's Lies by Ethan Cannon. What my father said was, you pays your dime, you takes your choice, which, if you don't understand it, boils down to him saying one thing to me, get out. He had a right to say it, though. I had it coming, and he's not a man who says, excuse me and pardon me. He's a man who tells the truth. Some guys my age are kids, but I'm 18 and getting married, and that's a big difference. It's a tough thing to get squeezed from your own house, but my father's done all right because he's tough. He owns a, he runs a steam press in Roxbury. When the deodorant commercials come on the set, he turns the TV off. That's the way he is. There's no second chance with him. Anyway, I'll do all right. Getting out of the house is what I wanted, so it's no hair off my head. You can't get everything you want. This summer, two things I wanted were to get out of the house finally and to go up to Fountain Lake with Katie, and I got both. You don't have that happen very often, so I'm not doing so bad. It's summer, and I'm out of high. That's a relief. Some guys don't make it through, but they're the ones I was talking about, the kids. Part of the reason I made it is that my folks pushed me. Until I was old enough to believe it, my mother used to tell me the lie that anybody can be what you want to. Anybody can rise up to be the president of the United States, she used to say. Somewhere along the line you find it's just not true that you're either fixed from the start or you're fixed by something you do without really thinking about it. I guess I was fixed by both. My mother, though, she doesn't give up. She got up 20 minutes early to make me provolone on rye for four years solid and cry when I got my diploma. After graduation is when I got the job at Abel's. Abel's a movie theater, a 250 seat, one aisle house on South Huntington. Abel's, where the service is friendly and the popcorn is fresh. The bathrooms are cold water only, though, and Mr. Abel spends Monday morning sewing the ripped upholstery seat himself because he won't let loose a, a few grand to recover the loges, which, for some reason, are coming apart faster than the standard seats. I don't know why that is. I sell maybe one-third loge tickets. And that clientele doesn't carry pen knives to go with the fabric with. The ones who carry knives are the ones who hang out in front. They wouldn't cut anybody, but they might take the sidewall off your tire. They're the ones who stopped at 10th grade when the law says you don't care anymore. They hang out in front drinking usually. Almost in, they almost never actually come in and see the movie. I work inside half the time selling tickets, and the other half is a projectionist. It's not a bad job. 
I memorize most movies, but one thing about a movie theater is that it's always dark inside, even in the lobby, because of the tinted glass. You've seen that. The way the light explodes when they open the exit door. But when you work in the ticket booth and you're looking outside to where it's bright daylight and you're looking through metal bars and sometimes that makes you think. Pause here for just a second. It's a very interesting analogy. Movie theater, looking at the bright light outside, and you're looking through the metal bars. Metal bars, light inside, dark. I mean, light outside, dark inside. Hmm, metal bars. Just think about that. What does it remind you of? Hopefully, you've never experienced that yourself. Okay, so back to the story, but that's just important. That little idea is planted in his head that this job at a movie theater is like being stuck in a prison. Okay, anyway, on a hot afternoon when I see the wives coming in indoors for a matinee, I wanna push their money back under the slot. I wanna ask them, what in the world are they doing that for? Trading away the light and the space outside for a seat here? Okay, well, the projectionist half of the job isn't so bad, even though most people don't even know what one is. They don't realize some clown is sitting in the room where the projectors are and changing the reels when it's time. Actually, most of the time, the guy's just smoking, which he's not supposed to do, or... <laughs> He has some girl in there, which is what I sometimes did with Katie. All there is to do is watch for the yellow dot that comes on in the corner of the screen when it's time to change the reel. When I see that yellow dot, there's five seconds before I have to have the other projector running. It's not hard. And after a while, you kind of develop a sense. You get good enough so you can walk out to the lobby, maybe have popcorn, a medium drink, sit on the stairs for a while before you had to get back in the booth. Perfectly timed to catch that yellow dot and get the next reel going. Anyway, it's pretty easy. But once I was in the booth with Katie when she told me something that made me forget to change the reel. The movie stopped and the theater was dark and then everybody starts to boo. And I hear Mr. Abel's voice right up next to the wall. Get on the ball, Jack, he says. And I have the other projector on even before he has time to open the door. If he knew Katie was in there, he would have canned me. Later, he tells me it's my last warning. What Katie told me was that she loved me. Nobody ever told me they loved me before, except my mother, which is obvious. And I remember it exactly because suddenly I knew how old I was and how old I was getting. After she said that, getting older wasn't what I wanted anymore. It's the way you feel after you get your first job. I remember exactly what she said. She said, I love you, Jack. I thought about it and I know what I mean. I'm in love with you. Okay, another pause there because this is also an important part, excuse me. It's also an important part because now he's making this analogy. Here's this girl that he really likes, obviously. And she's told him that she loves him. Well, he compares this to the feeling you get after you get your first job and it's not, exactly what you thought it was. So think about it, it's important. Before you get your first job, we tend to kind of idolize that, especially if you're young. Oh, this is gonna be great, I'm gonna have freedom, I'm gonna have money to do what I want, I don't have to ask my parents for anything. But what sometimes happens is after you get that first job and you've worked for a little bit and you think, okay, this is work. It actually reminds me of a story about Emma, but we'll save that for later.
you know, I don't like to get too much off track. All right. But anyway, just think about that because it will become important. I mean, this is a big moment, but it makes them feel like, whoa, am I ready for this? So what would you do? Well, this guy says, at the time, the thing to do was kiss her. Smart guy. Which I did. I wanted to tell her that I loved her too, but I couldn't say it. I don't mind lying, but not about that. Anyway, we're up there in the booth together, and it's while we have our tongues in each other's mouths that the reel runs out. Another important, oh, sorry about that part, guys. It is in the script. Um, another important point. So the reel runs out. That's another big thing that's mentioned in here, obviously, is this movie reel. And that could be symbolic too. So think about that when you're thinking about, hmm, what should I write about for symbols in this story? Okay, now we're going back again. The first time I met Katie, was at the theater. She's a pretty girl, all eyes, hair that's not quite blonde. It falls a certain way. It was the thing I noticed first, the way it sat there on her shoulders. But it more than just sat. It touched her shoulders like a pair of hands. Went in around the collar of her shirt and touched her neck. She was three rows in front. I wasn't working at the theater yet. It was the end of senior year and I was sitting in two seats and had a box of popcorn in my lap. My friend LaFranc was next to me. We both saw Katie when she came in. LaFranc lit a match. Put me out, he said, before we all burn. LaFranc plays trumpet. He doesn't know what to say to a girl. During the bright parts of the movie, I kept looking at her neck. She's with three other girls we don't recognize. Turns out they go to Catholic school, which is why we don't know them. Then about halfway through, she gets up by herself and heads back up the aisle. LaFranc breathes out and lights another match. I smile and think about following her back as she heads out, but then where I might say something at the candy counter, but there's always a chance she's going to the ladies' room, and then where would I be? So time is on my side, so I decide to wait. The movie is the right stuff. They're taking up supersonic planes when this is happening. They're talking about the envelope, and I don't know what that means. And then suddenly, Katie's sitting next to me. I don't know where she came from. Can I have some popcorn, she says. You can have the whole box, I answer. I don't know where this comes from either, but it's the perfect thing to say. And I feel a little bit of my life happening. I push the bucket toward Katie. Her hands are milk. She takes a few pieces and holds them with her palm flat up. Already I'm thinking, that's something I would never do. The way she holds the little pop kernels like that, then she chews them slowly, one by one, while I pretend to watch the movie. Things come into my head. After the movie, I talk to her a little, so we go on a few dates. In the meantime, I get the theater job at Abel's. And in August, she invites me to her sister's wedding. Her sister's marrying a guy 20 years older named Hank. He's a, he, it's at a big church in Saugus. By, the time, by this time, Katie and I have kissed maybe two hours total. She always bites a piece of juicy fruit in two when we're done and gives me half. Anyway, at the wedding, I walk in wearing a coat and tie and had to meet her parents. Her father's got something wrong with one of his eyes. I'm not sure which one's the bad one, and I'm worried he's thinking I'm shifty because I don't know which one to look at. We shake hands and he doesn't say anything. We put our hands down and he still doesn't say anything. I've been at work, I say. It's a line I thought about. I don't know what the hell you kids want. 
he says then, that's exactly what he says. I look at him. I realize he's drunk or been drinking. And then in a second, Katie's mother's all over him. At practically the same time, she's also kissing me on the cheek and pulling and telling me, oh, you look good in your suit and pulling Katie over from where she's talking with a couple of her girlfriends. For the ceremony, we sit in the pews. I'm on the aisle with her mother one row in front and a couple seats over so that I can see all the pleats and hems and the miniature flowers sewn into the dress. I can hear her breathing. The father who's paid for the whole bag full is pacing behind the nave door waiting to give away the bride. Katie's back there too with the other bridesmaids. They're wearing those dresses that stay up without straps. The wedding starts and the bridesmaid come up the aisle finally ahead of the bride in those dresses that remind you all the time. Katie's at the front and when they pass me, stepping slowly, she leans over and gives me half a piece of juicy fruit. So anyway, we've already been to a wedding together and maybe thanks to that, I'm not so scared of our own which is coming up, it's gonna be in November. A fall wedding, though actually, it's not going to be a wedding at all, but just something done by the justice of the peace. It's better that way. I had enough the first time seeing Katie's father pace. He has loose skin all over his face and a tired look, and I don't want that at our wedding. And besides, things are changing. I'm not sure who I'd want to come to a big wedding. I'm 18 in two months, and so is Katie. And to tell the truth, I'm starting to get a little tired of my friends. It's another phase I'm coming into, probably. My friends are Hadley and Mike and LaFranc. LaFranc is my best friend. Katie doesn't like Hadley or Mike. And she thinks LaFranc is okay, mostly because he was there when we met. But LaFranc plays amazing trumpet. And if there's a way to get him to play at our Justice of the Peace wedding, I'm going to get him to do it. I want him to play because sometimes I think of how this bit with Katie started and how fast it's gone. And it kind of stuns me that this is what happened. That of all the ways a life can turn out, this is the way mine's going to. Pause again, folks. Another important point in this story, you have to think about what is revealed about Jack's feelings on his upcoming wedding. Clearly, and remember the term ambivalence, there's some strong mixed emotions here. Not exactly joy in the way he describes the wedding or in the very last line I just read, that of all the ways a life can turn out, this is the way mine's going to. Sounds a little bit like he might be feeling just a tad out of control, like a movie that's about to run out. Okay, so back to the story. We didn't get up to Fountain Lake until a couple months after her sister's wedding. It's a Sunday and I'm sitting on the red and black carpet of, a of Abel's lobby steps, eating a meeting and popcorn. I'm waiting for the real change to come. Abel himself is upstairs in the office, so I'm just sitting there watching the sun outside through the ticket window, thinking this is the kind of day I'd rather be doing something else. The clowns out front have their shirts off. They're hanging around out there, and I'm sitting in the lobby when a car honks, and then honks again. I look over, and I'm so surprised. I think the sun's doing something to my eyes. It's Katie in a red Cadillac. It's got white walls and chrome and she's honking at me. I don't even know where she learned to drive. But she honks again and the guys out front start to laugh and point inside the theater. 
What's funny is, I know they can't see inside because of the tin, but they're pointing right at me anyway. There's certain times in your life when you do things and have to stick to them later. And nobody likes to do that. But this was one of them. And Katie was going to honk again if I didn't do something. My father has a saying about it, like getting caught between two rocks. But if you knew Mr. Abel and you knew Katie, you'd know it wasn't, you'd know it wasn't like getting caught between two rocks at all. It was more like one rock and then Katie sitting in a Cadillac. So I get up and set the popcorn down, down on the snack bar and then walk over and look through the door. I stand there maybe half a minute. All the while I'm counting off the time in my head until I have to be back in to change the reel. I think of my father. He's worked every day of his life. I think of Mr. Abel sewing on the loge upholstery with fishing line. They're banking on me and I know it. And I start to feel kind of bad. But outside there's Katie in a red Fleetwood, king of the Cadillac line. I say to myself, it's a blazing afternoon, and as soon as I open that door, I know I'm not coming back. On the street, the sun's thrashing around off the fenders and the white shirts, and it's like walking into a wall. But I cross the street without really knowing what I'm doing and get into the car on the driver's side. All the time I'm crossing the street, I know everything. Everybody's looking, but nobody says anything. When I get into the car, I slip the seat back a little. How'd you get this? It's Hank, she says. It's new. Where should we go? I don't know what she's doing with Hank's car, but my foot's pushing up and down on the gas, and the clowns out front are looking, and I have to do something, and I say the lake. Let's go to Fountain Lake. I put it in drive and the tires squeal for a second before we're gone. The windows are up and I swear the car's so quiet I'm not sure there's an engine. I push the gas and don't hear anything but just feel the leather seats pushing up under our backs. The leather's cool and has this buttered look. The windshield is tinted at the top. After about three blocks, I start thinking to myself, I'm out. And I wheel the Cadillac out to make a way toward the river. I really don't know the way up to Fountain Lake, but neither does Katie. So I don't ask. We cross over the river at BU and head up Memorial Drive, past all the college students on the lawns throwing frisbees and plastic footballs. Over by Harvard, they're pulling roll, rowing skulls out of the water. They're all wearing their red jackets and holding big glasses of beer while they work. The grass is so green, it hurts my eyes. On the long stretch past Boylston, I put the, down the electric window and hold my arm out so that the air picks it up like a wing as we speed up. And then just before we get out to the highway, something clicks in my head and I know it's time to change the reel. I touch the brakes for a second. I count to five and imagine the theater going dark than one of the wives in the audience saying something out loud, real irate. I see Mr. Abel opening the door to the projection booth, the expression on his face, just like one my father has. It's a certain look, half like he's hit somebody and half like somebody's hit him. But then we come out on to route, route two and I hit the gas hard. One of my father's sayings comes to me that it's all water over the bridge. 
and it's like inside my head, another reel finally runs out. Just like that, that part of my life is gone. By the time we're out past Lincoln, I'm not really thinking anything except, wow, we're out of here. The car feels good. You get a feeling sometimes right after you do something. Katie's next to me with her real tight body and the soft way girls look, and I'm no kid anymore. I think about how nice it would be to be able to take the car whenever you want and go up to the lake. I'm thinking all this and floating the car around big wide turns, and I can see the hills now way up the road in front of us. I look over at Katie, and then at that long yellow line sliding under the front of the car, and it seems to me like I'm doing something big. All the time, Katie's just sitting there. Then she says, I can't believe it. She's right. I'm on the way to Fountain Lake, going fast in a car, the red arrow shivering around 75 in the dial, a girl next to me, pretty, Smell in the nice way girls do. And I turn to her and I don't know why, except you get a feeling when you finally bust out. And I say, I love you, Katie. And a certain kind of voice, my foot crushing the accelerator and the car booming along the straightaways like it's some kind of rocket. And so ends that story, folks. Again, Lies by Ethan Kanan. So it makes you wonder, there's a lot in this story besides the fact that it's told in flashback and it goes in and out. It doesn't follow chronological order. That's an important point to think about because remember that opening paragraph, he's telling us everything after it's already happened. That's what he sets up. You know, let me tell you something that happened this past summer. And basically it tells us his father kicked him out of the house. And then everything that follows, he's telling us why, why. So I'm not going to tell you what to think here, but I want you to think about, well, what is the lie in the story? What's the big lie? What is this story really about? How does this guy feel? Why is he getting married when we clearly see there's a lot of complex emotions going on? So go back to the story and look at the parts where he's talking about the wedding, not only his own upcoming wedding, which isn't really a wedding at all, except something done by the justice of the peace. And then, of course, Katie's sister sweating and his feelings associated with that. And there are a lot of other symbols in this story, by the way, besides just the movie reel. So listen, there will be stuff posted online. There already is. This video will hopefully be there. And I'd like you to write a journal response in addition to asking those literary questions. What's the theme? What are the symbols? What does this story mean? And I will be recording, um, well, pretty much all of the stories in the unit. Mrs. Kraft is also recording some. So look for that. I believe at the end of this week, um, we'll get more formal guidelines about how the rest of the semester is going to look. But no matter what, I would like you guys to see me and then maybe we could set up small groups as well in a zoom chat session to where i can see you too okay until then be well stay safe and stay inside the house okay thanks guys i'll talk to you soon